Is everyone alive? Yes. Yes. And of those who are alive, how many are awake? I can't hear you. All of us. I still can't hear you. All of us. I'm hard of hearing. I'm deaf. I still can't hear you. All of us. Louder, louder. All of us. Better. Louder, once more. All of us. Sorry, love. Sorry, love. <laughs> Give it one last shot. Come on. One, two, three. All of us. Well done. That's the way. All right. Hello. Uh, good morning. My name is Umesh. Uh, I've been studying birds for the last 12 years in Arunachal Pradesh and I'm going to talk to you today about the kind of work, uh, some of the themes or concepts related to the work that I do in Arunachal Pradesh. So we'll start off talking about bird communities, which is uh, how and why various species of birds coexist in the same place at the same time. We'll move on to biogeography, which is the study of species distributions, why are species distributed in certain places, what are the causes for uh, patterns and distribution? Uh, species distributions over large scales, uh, geographical scale, uh, large geographical scales, or continental scales, or global scales, uh, as uh, for this session. So, what is a bird community? Does anybody have a definition for a bird community? Different populations of birds. Sorry? Different populations of birds uh, in a given area at a given time. Different populations of birds in a given area at a given time. That's very close. So a community is a set of ecologically interacting species or interacting organisms that occur in a certain place and at a certain time. So they have to be there in the same place and they have to be there at the same time and they have to interact ecologically. So the interactions being, you know, predation, competition, facilitation, and we'll talk about all those interactions. But usually when you talk about communities, they're not limited to taxonomic groups. <clears throat> so uh, a, a community could be all the trees that make up the uh, forage for the insects that the birds eat, and then the mammals that prey on the birds. All of those interacting species form a community. Right? When we talk about bird communities, what we're talking about is usually what are called assemblages. Assemblages are sets of species or groups of species that are found at a particular location, which are usually taxonomically in the same group. So you can talk about assemblages of trees and assemblages of birds. Uh, but when we say community ecology, when we say bird community ecology, what we actually mean is that we are studying bird assemblages rather than uh, all the interactions that happen between birds and other taxonomic groups like plants and insects and fruits and so on. Now, Communities are complex things. There are a lot of organisms in communities. And to make sense of communities, one has to sort of simplify and you know, create ways in which to describe these communities. So one of the ways to do it is to look at species diversity. Now, a couple of terms here. If you look at the top, species richness is simply the number of species that are there in the community. So that's what's called species richness. So if you have 20 species of birds, in uh, Desert National Park, that means the species richness of Desert National Park is 20. Yeah? When you talk about species diversity, you're not only taking into account the number of species, you're also taking into account the abundance of those species. Right? Because all species are not equal when it comes to abundance. Some species are more common, other species are rare. So when you put together both the number of species as well as the relative abundances of those species, you get to a metric called species diversity. Uh, let's look at two communities here. On the x-axis is sampling effort in ours. So right over there, you've not done any sampling. You've not gone out and counted birds, not gone out and looked for birds. And as you go along this axis, more you spend one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours, and so on, looking for birds. Right? So your effort in terms of looking for birds is increasing on the x-axis. The y-axis is the number of species. Now, if all species were common, would you find them in a short time or a, or a long time? A short time. And the rarer the species is, the longer it will take you to find that species, the more effort you need to put in to find those species. So this is called a, an accumulation curve or a rarefaction curve. If you look at this community here, it's got very few species, right? It's not, that's the number of species. On the y-axis, it's got very few species. But all the species are common because it's taken you very little time 
to find all the species. And beyond this point, you're not adding any more species. There are no new species being added, right? It's flattened out. If there were new species being added with effort, you would see something like this. Until you get to a point where you've seen all the species, and so you're not adding any more species. And so the number of species will remain unchanged <coughs> beyond a certain effort point. Is that clear? Does that make sense? There are a limited number of species. If there are lots of rare species, you take a lot more time to find them. But beyond a point, you run out of species. There are no more species to be found. And therefore, the number of species remains a plateau. Yeah? Yeah. So this is a, is a community that has few, very common species. That is a community that has a large number of species, a lot of which are rare, because you've taken a lot more time to find those species. Another way to look at this is uh, what's called the rank abundance curve. Or the x-axis is abundance rank. So if you took all these species and you counted the numbers of individuals in each of these species, and you say species A has 10 individuals, species B has 6 individuals, species C has 2 individuals, then the commonest species gets rank 1. The second most common species gets rank 2. The third most common species gets rank 3 and so on. So the rare species will get very high ranks. So the commonest species here gets rank 1. And as you go along the ranks, you get lesser and lesser individuals of that species. So the y-axis is some measure of abundance. And the x-axis is the abundance rank. And you can see here, this black line has very few species. It's stopping off at 10. There are only 10 species here, right? Because this is the number of species. But the red line has 30 species. So this community is more species rich than this community. <coughs> and generally what we tend to see is uh, in tropical systems, like the Western Ghats or the Eastern Himalayas, you tend to have a few very common species and a large number of rare species. So the community as a whole is dominated by a few very common species. And uh, you have a long tail of rare species that are at low abundances. Whereas in temperate forests, you're not getting, you're not going down to very, very rare species. Right? You have fewer species, but most of them tend to be relatively common. Is this clear? Does this make sense? All right. Why are some species rare? What could be the reasons why species are rare? Endemism. 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 Yes. Small yeah, so there's limited in geographical space. Yeah, or it, just food. Uh, it only feeds uh, specifically on uh, particular. Very good. So that means they're specialized on, on a certain resource. And that resource is not very abundant. So they have to, right? And we will discuss, there are six types of rarity. We will discuss that when we talk uh, talk about conservation, uh, bird conservation. Uh, any other reasons? Low risk of predation. Can poaching. Poaching. So human pressures on on species. So that might be one reason why they're rare. If the bird is shy. I can't see who's. If the bird is shy. Bird is shy. So what if you have a very very common species, but it's shy? So you don't see it, and you think it's rare, but actually it's not. So then we get into a problem called detection probability. Right? So the bird is there, but what is the probability that you will detect it? And that we get into when we talk about field techniques and methods for studying birds. Uh, but yes, you might think a species is rare because it's shy, and you're not likely to detect it. Uh, low, I mean, the fertility period for the female might be very short, and um, the separation between the sexes would reduce the chances of mating. The breeding season might be very short. No, no, the fertility, the number of days the female is fertile for, right. might be very short. And so, and if there's ah, a separation... So the probability of finding a male during your uh, breeding season is limited. Yeah. And that's the reason why you're short. So that could be because the densities of these individuals are uh, so low that the probability of you coming across a male when you have to breed is very so. So that's rarity in itself, right? Yeah. Uh, if the species are top predators, uh, 
Its number would be less compared to other species. Absolutely. So species might be top predators, which means they occupy higher trophic levels. Is everybody familiar with the concept of a trophic level? Yes. You have producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers. And uh, what happens when you go from a, a producer up to a consumer, the amount of energy available at higher and higher trophic levels reduces. As energy reduces, the capacity to support a large number of individuals also reduces. So generally lower trophic level uh, uh, species are much more common than higher trophic level species. So here are some of the reasons why species are rare. They might have specialized habitat requirements. So let's say species limited to bamboo and they can only forage in bamboo. Uh, they might be large body. Large bodied species need a lot, a lot of food. Uh, and therefore they might have to range large distances to find food. And therefore their territories might be very large. And in a given area, you, can't, you can pack in a lot of small territories, but you can't pack in a lot of large territories. And that's one of the reasons why large bodied species might be there. They might be high in the trophic chain, so they might be predators. Generally, higher the trophic level, the lower the abundance. Like you said, human activities, hunting and habitat loss uh, can cause low densities. Or the species could be at the edge of its geographic range. So generally what happens is, if you look at the range of a species, the geographical range of a, of a species, they tend to be most abundant in the center of the range. And as you go towards the edges of the range, the abundances of these species fall. So it might be rare at one part of its geographical range but very, very common elsewhere. And there are lots of species for which we don't know why they're rare. They're rare, but we have no idea why. All right, let's talk about diversity. Uh, we've, so far, we've been talking about uh, richness, rarity. Let's talk about diversity. Community ecologists talk about three types of diversity. There's alpha diversity, beta diversity, and gamma diversity. Right? Alpha diversity is the number of species at a particular location. So. Here are three locations. What is the alpha diversity of location one? Four. 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 Location two? Four. How many? Four. Four. And location three? Four. Four. So the alpha diversity of these three locations is identical. They all have four species. Right? Doesn't matter what those species are, the species could be different. So each of these symbols represents a species. Yeah, uh, and the number of species in each of these locations is four. Beta diversity is when you move from one location to another, how many new species are you adding, right? So when you move from here to here, how many new species are you adding? Two, three, one, two, three, two, one, two, 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 three, two, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, and you're adding a triangle, right? So beta diversity is also called turnover. When you go from one site to another site, what is the turnover in the number of species? How many species are being replaced from the previous site? And gamma diversity is the total number of species in the region. So if you have a region within which you have locations, each location has an alpha diversity. There are differences in uh, what species you have across locations, that difference is beta diversity. And finally, when you put alpha and beta diversity together for the whole region, that's gamma diversity. So how many, what is the gamma diversity of this? Six. 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 What is the turnover, what is the beta diversity between location one and three? Zero. 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 Right? So concepts of alpha, beta, gamma diversity are sort of clear? Yes. Yeah, so these are some terms that uh, ecologists use to <laughs> describe the diversity in a, a, a particular region. Now we get to a con concept that's very, very important in community ecology, which is called the niche. The niche is the set of abiotic and biotic factors that are required for a species to occur. Right? Abiotic factors meaning Factors in the environment like temperature, rainfall, and so on. Biotic factors are things like the availability of resources. So how much food is available, for example. So I just want to show you this graph. There's temperature on the x-axis, rainfall on the y-axis, 
and these are the niches of two species. Okay? So what can you say about the niches of these two species? Right. This species likes better areas with more rainfall. This species likes drier areas with less rainfall. This species is able to tolerate a much wider range in temperature than this species. Right? Is that clear? Yeah. So this is the way, some of the ways in which you can describe a niche. What kind of temperature and rainfall areas do these species occur in? So in other words, the niche is the environmental conditions under which a species lives, as well as the resources that the species uses. Now, there are two kinds of niches, classically, that have been described. There's the fundamental niche, and there's the, required, uh, the realized niche. The fundamental niche is the niche that exists in the absence of biotic interactions like competition, predation, and so on. So it's just the environmental conditions that are required for a species to occur. So what temperatures can they tolerate? If you have a species, what temperatures can it tolerate? What rainfall does it require? Uh, you know, these sorts of factors, you know, humidity, and so on. So that is the fundamental niche. It can exist potentially in all those regions where temperature, its temperature and rainfall requirements are met. However, usually species don't do that. They can't do that. The reason for that is they're limited by biotic interactions. Biotic interactions being competition and radiation. So you might have a species that can potentially occupy a large space, but because of competition from other species, it cannot exist there, but its niche becomes smaller. So that is called the realized niche. The realized niche in the, is in the presence of competition, predation, and so on, that limits where the species can live and cannot expand completely into its <coughs> fundamental niche. So when you talk about niche, there's something called niche breadth. Niche breadth is the range of abiotic and biotic conditions under which a species can occur. So some species have wide niches. They're called generalists, right? Because they can occur and live in a wide variety of environmental conditions, like the rock pigeon, right? You see it in various kinds of habitats, uh, and it, get, it does well in various kinds of habitats. Then you have specialists, which are very narrow niche prints, uh, widths. Uh, these are uh, birds that will be limited, for example, to certain habitats, like this black nested parrot bill here. It is limited to alluvial grassland, so flooded grassland, in, in the northeastern part of the country. So it's, it's got a very small range. It can only live in that habitat. If you take it out from there and put it in a city, that's it. It's, good. it's not going to be able to be. So you have generalists and specialists, and when you have two species that share the same resources, there's going to be some overlap in their niches, right? So a species that uses, let's say, a niche like that, a species that uses a niche like this, this species uses only this part of the niche, that species only uses that part of the niche, but there is some overlap in their niche. And we look at niche overlap here, again, on the x-axis is rainfall, y-axis is temperature, so higher up you go, the hotter it gets. The, uh, if you go towards the right, the rainier, the, water, the wetter it gets. So this species here likes hot, wet places. That blue species here likes cooler, drier places. But there is some area in which both those species overlap. So there, there is some amount of overlap between the niches of these uh, species. Right? Uh, and if two species overlap greatly in their niches, would you think they would compete more or less? More, more, more. more right? So if, if two species are sharing exactly the same resource, there's going to be very high competition between the species. So uh, allied with the concept of the niche is what's called the guild. A guild is a group of species with similar niches. And classically in bird community ecology, the guild is defined based on your diet. So you have frugivores, frugivores that eat fruit, granivores that eat seeds, insectivores that eat insects, nectarivores that eat nectar. Okay? So they use similar foraging strategies and they have similar diets. So all birds within, all birds that eat insects are in the guild of insectivores. All birds that eat fruits are in the guild of frugivores. Now, uh, now the guild concept can be extended to other things. So for example, uh, if birds, all the birds that nest in tree holes form the cavity nesting uh, guild. So the guild concept is, is very, very uh, 
uh, important uh, when you're thinking about uh, why certain species behave a certain way or why certain species respond to environmental change in certain ways. All right. Now let's get to interact species interactions within communities. And there are a wide variety of species interactions uh, in ecological communities. There's competition, which is of two types, exploitation and interference. We talked about that. There's commensalism, mutualism, <coughs> ancestorism, and predation. Right. Let's get to competition. And this is interspecific competition. This is competition between two species. And if it was within one species, it would be called intraspecific competition. Right? We are talking about interspecific competition, where one species competes with the other. And there are two types of uh, competition between two species. There's exploitation competition, which is also sometimes called scramble competition. That is indirect. Right? Let's say there's a masala dosa on that table. Right? And all of us want that masala dosa. Right? And I'm not going to interact directly with you. I'm not going to fight you for it. What I'll do is get there first and eat it. So I don't interact with you at all. It's a common resource that all of us share. But without interacting with you directly, I reduce the amount of resources available to you. And that's a very common thing. So you've got a large number of insects in, in the habitat. And you get, some bird gets there earlier, some species gets there earlier, depletes the number of insects available to other birds. That's what's called exploitation competition because they're exploiting the resource and reducing its availability to other species. There's also interference competition, and that's direct, right? That's, I will steal food from you. I will harass you and steal food from you. So for example, this is a pretty common one. Pelicans go out fishing, and uh, they catch fish and come up, and the guns harass them so much that the pelican says, okay, boss, lay down. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't want this fish anymore. So this is what's called interference competition. It's direct, it's through aggression, it's through dominance, uh, and it's, this, it's basically snatching resources away uh, from another species. All right. uh, competition is a very, very uh, fundamental uh, concept in community ecology. Uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, one of the principle, guiding principles is what's called competitive exclusion. Competitive exclusion says that no two species can occupy identical niches. So if there are two species that are absolutely identical in their niches, they're like the same rainfall, they're like the same temperature, they eat the same food, then they cannot coexist. One of them will be driven to extinction by the other. And the support for these uh, competitive exclusion uh, principle was initially from uh, what were called checkerboard distributions. Now, checkerboard, if you look at a chessboard, you've got black and white, black and white, black and white. And black and white don't coexist. You've got black, you've got white, you've got black, you've got white. So that's what's called a checkerboard distribution. And this example, very famous example from the South Pacific, is for two species of cuckoo doves. There's the black billed cuckoo dove, uh, that one there, which occurs on these islands. And there's the McKinley's cuckoo dove, which is in yellow and occurs in these islands. But on no island will you find both of them coexisting. So the idea being that both these species have very, very similar ecological requirements. And if you put the two together, one will outcompete uh, the other one, resulting in these checkerboard patterns where you only have one species. Out of two similar species, you only have one species on, on a particular island. You also see these patterns uh, in, in, in mountains. It's not a checkerboard pattern. But this is from the tropical Andes, and this is a group of birds called the tanagers. So very closely related birds. And you see that in lowland rainforest, you have one species. As you move up to humid foothill forest, it's replaced by one species, closely related species. You move up to humid cloud forest, a third species uh, comes in. And the fourth in elephant forest is a completely different species. So there are very strong boundaries between the elevational ranges of these species. Is this, is this clear? No. Yes. This will not coexist with this. They will not be found in the same place. This is only here. This is only, the other one is only here. So there are very sharp boundaries between potentially competing species on elevation gradients. And that's why you tend to see as you go up in elevation, competition occurring at these edges. And then the whole community turning over because you've got sets of competing species 
higher up and lower down, and you see community turnover as you go up. Interesting recent study that came out only last month. Uh, this is about uh, two pairs of sister species, so very, very closely related species. These two are sister species, which means they share a common single ancestor. Right? Very, very close, most closely related possible. These two are another pair of sister species. These two species do not defend territories. There is no territorial defense. Okay? They, they forage wherever they like, they don't defend territories. These two, very, very strong territorial defense. They will <coughs> set up territories, establish territories, and fight for them. But what you see here, this is elevation on the y-axis, and these are the ranges of these species. So if you look at the species that have no territorial defense, the ranges overlap. Right? This, is, this one goes from you know, 0 meters to about 1,600 meters. That one goes from about 500 meters to less than 3,000 meters. And there's a large overlap in the elevation range. Is this, is this clear? Yes. Yeah? Yes. When you look at the species that defend territories year round, the ones that defend territories compete very strongly. And there's no overlap in their elevation ranges. So below 1,800 meters, one species. Above 1,800 meters, a different species. Leave it at the end. Thanks. Right. So is there any evidence that competition occurs in nature? Some of the things are what's called density inflation. So if you have two competing species and you take out one, you can't take out one, but there are natural places, for example, on islands. So on the mainland, you might have two species that are competing with each other. On an island, you might have one species disappearing. And on the island, you'll find that the density of the other species increases greatly. Uh, potentially because there's nothing to compete with it to keep its densities low. So that's called density inflation. There's also called some, something called ecological release. You remember we were talking about fundamental and realized niches. Competition causes the realized niche to become much smaller than the fundamental niche. And in the absence of competition, you can expand your niche. You can eat more things. You can live in different habitats. And that is because the, com the competitor that was limiting you to a particular habitat, limiting you to particular foods, is now no longer present. And therefore, you expand your uh, niche. The third thing is something called character displacement. It is all terms used in community ecology. A character displacement is where if you have two competing species, they will tend to diverge in their uh, morphological characteristics. So if you, if you and I are competing, and we both are kingfishers, we both live in the same place, and we're eating the same food, to coexist, to be able to coexist, what we'll have to do is to start feeding on different things. And to do that, you'll have to grow a larger beak because you eat larger fish. I'll have to grow a smaller beak because I would now specialize in smaller fish. But if I'm alone, I can eat all the fish. So when uh, two key fishes are together, their beaks will diverge. Right? But when there's only one species there in the, in the community, it does not need to uh, specialize. And therefore, uh, it, it, it will be able to feed on uh, large bracket. Finally, about competition, how do, organ how do species avoid interspecific competition? And here is uh, one way. That you could do it in, species could do it in many ways. Geographical separation, they could do it by between habitat segregation within a uh, region, or within habitat segregation, or segregation in time. Segregation means just uh, separation, right? So geographic segregation means I can't live with you, so your range is geographically different from mine. So I will occupy this part of the range, you occupy this part of the range, and we won't overlap because we, both of us cannot coexist. So that's geographical segregation. There's something called between habitat segregation, which is in the same region, I will occupy marshland, you occupy forest. So we will not compete because the habitats that we prefer, the habitats that we use, are different. Then there's within habitat segregation. So all of us, this is a classic example uh, by Hutchinson from the 50s, is the five species of warblers that all breed and feed in coniferous trees. But within the coniferous tree, which is their habitat, they use different parts of the coniferous trees for foraging. So the Cape May warbler uses the top, 
the Blackburnian uses the top and the uh, upper part, the bay breasted uses just the center, the yellow rump uses the bottom part, and the black throated uses the center, but uh, it also features some older needles of the pine tree. So within the pine tree, you have five species of warblers, but they're all segregating within the habitat uh, to avoid competition with each other. So, and the segregation in time. Uh, for example, bats eat pollen, sunbirds eat pollen. Sunbirds will come out at, uh, in the day, will eat pollen, and the bats will come out at night. So there's no direct competition uh, between these species. All right, so that was competition. Commensalism is another kind of interaction where there are two species involved. One species benefits from associating with, our, with the other species, but it does not affect the other species that it's associating with. So the famous thing with the buffaloes and the cattle egret, the buffaloes walk through the grass, they disturb insects, which the cattle egret benefits from, but it makes no difference to the buffalo. Right? So it's a common synergistic uh, relationship between the buffalo and the cattle egret. Now, another example is black prongo nests. You know, black prongos are very aggressive birds. Uh, when they build nests, a lot of other species will build nests around them or next to them because they know that if a predator comes in, the black prongo is going to attack it. So their nests are also safe. So they get benefits from associating with the black prongo. Black prongo ko koi tarke bata hai. Black prongo doesn't care. Huh? Right? So this is a, a common uh, relationship. Another one is what is called mutualism. Mutualism is an ecological interaction in which both species benefit. So I bring something to the table, you bring something to the table, both of us benefit. A good example is within mixed species bird flocks, uh, where you've got this white crested laughing thrush that forages in large groups, large flocks, in the undergrowth. So they're searching for insects in the undergrowth, their head is always stuck in leaves and twigs and stuff, so they can't detect predators. The drongo, on the other hand, feeds on flying insects. So it's sitting looking around for insects that are flying above. And it will go off and catch those insects. But while it's looking around, it's also looking around for predators. So the drongo is a very good, what's called a sentinel. Right? It can look uh, for predators, whereas these can't. But what these do is they flush insects into the air, which the drongo can eat. So the drongo is getting foraging benefits from associating with these species. And what do these species get out of the drongo? Warnings against predators, because they can't look out for predators themselves. So it's a mutualistic relationship. One benefits from being warned against predators, the other gets food to eat. Right? So both partners benefit. Uh, this parasitism is an interaction in which one species benefits, but the other is harmed. So all our parasites, you know, malaria for example, the malarial parasite benefits, the host is harmed. Uh, avian bird malaria is uh, becoming uh, more, more of a problem. It's led to extinctions in uh, the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and there's also something called kleptoparasitism. Kleptoparasitism is one, one species steals food from the other. Uh, like this kestrel is trying to steal food from this barn owl. And that, so the kestrel is what's called, in this case, not always, is a kleptoparasite. Uh, okay, predation. Everybody knows what that is. It's when one species attacks and kills and eats the other. And predation is thought to be a very important ecological interaction that structures communities, that determines what kind of species are there, how, what is the abundance of those species. Uh, and we talk about that in a little bit. I just want to touch upon mixed species bird flocks uh, for a little bit. Mixed species bird flocks are groups of insectivorous birds that forage together. So you can have up to, you know, in Arunachal Pradesh, you can have up to 40 species in the same flock, all moving together, all feeding together, right? So it's not as if, you know, this species feeds here, that species feeds there, and they're all doing things independently. It's a very cohesive group. And these uh, groups are made up of uh, what are called nuclear species. Nuclear species are responsible for bringing the group together and for maintaining those groups over time. And there are what are called attended species. Attended species are those that follow nuclear species. So nuclear species are providing some benefits to the attended species. And generally in mixed flocks, you can find the entire range of ecological interactions. You can find mutualisms, you can find commensalisms, you can find parasitism, you can find competition. Uh, predation is a major factor that leads to the formation of these flocks because the more birds there are, the lesser the chances of any one bird being eaten. And so, so predation is a very important uh, reason for why mixed flocks are formed. And there are lots of aspects of mixed species flocks 
that are very interesting and are yet to be uh, studied. So if anybody would be interested in talking about big species flux, uh, please do. Uh, we'll end uh, with how communities are structured and assembled, how, how the communities come to be. You know, there are lots of species. Why do only certain species occur together? And why not all species occurring together and so on? So this, each of these dots is a species. They're all related somehow. That's just a tree that shows how related these species are. And each species differs in its traits. So the sizes of these dots, the colors of these dots, and the patterns within these dots that represent the traits of species. So the black species are all, let's say, insectivorous birds that vary in body size, and so on. So these represent traits. But all species can't occur in the same, let's say, temperature. Some species like the cold, some species like warm, uh, warm environments. So there's a habitat that imposes a filter. Huh? So if, it, if your temperature range is 20 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius, obviously something that likes minus 10 is not going to, so that's filtered out. And something that likes really warm temperatures, that's also filtered out. So there's a habitat that imposes a filter, and then you get a habitat species pool where species are more similar in their traits. And finally, at more local scales, competition, predation, facilitation, etc., then determine what kind of communities you find. So again, mixed flocks are a very interesting system because you have a large group of species. There's a filter, the filter being eating insects. So only insectivorous birds can join mixed flocks, do join mixed flocks, or uh, by and large. So then you've got this pool, the local species pool, which then assorts itself into various kinds of flocks. So if there was no interactions, right? For I don't care who I associate it with, I associate it, you get what's, you get like a neutrally structured mixed flock. If competition is driving the structure of these mixed flocks, then you want to have as dissimilar species as possible. Species that don't overlap much in their niches. So competition should lead to different species associated different kinds of species. If facilitation is the thing, then similar species should associate that. There's no competition involved. So then you see, you should see flocks that are uh, structured that way. So just again, keeping in mind, mixed species flocks are a very, very interesting system in, in birds. And a lot of questions in community ecology uh, for a lot of questions that are very good model systems to work. We'll finally end with food chains and food webs. Everybody is familiar with food chains and food webs, right? Is there anybody who doesn't know about food chains and food webs? No, I didn't know for a long time, so uh, if you want me to go into details, we can. But it's just who eats what, right? So a food web is a very complex thing. A food chain is a single strand in the food web. So for example, phytoplankton to benthic invertebrates or sea ducks to bald eagle, that's a food chain. And when you put together multiple food chains, you get a food web. Uh, and the reason why we're talking about that is to understand how communities are structured. Is it top-down processes or bottom-up processes that are structured? Okay. So top-down processes means something's happening from the top at the higher profit level. So predation is what is structuring communities. So if you remove the predator, the communities will change drastically. And bottom-up is when the availability of resources is what drives uh, the way in which communities are structured. Right? So here's a very interesting example. It's not birds, I know, but uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, sea otters prey on what's called kelp. Kelp is a large seaweed. And <coughs> what eats kelp? Sea urchins. So here's kelp, here's sea urchins, uh, sorry. Sea otters prey on sea urchins. And the sea urchins graze on kelp. Huh? Now, killer whales used to eat seals earlier in this area, in the Bering Sea. For some reason, seals disappeared, <coughs> some infection or whatever. And the sea, uh, these started eating sea otters. The uh, killer whales started eating sea otters. So the top predator in the system, in the kelp forest, disappeared. When it disappeared, the abundance of sea urchins rose greatly. So the, when there were a lot of sea otters, there were very few sea urchins. Then when the otters disappeared, the sea urchin uh, numbers went up, grazing went up, and kelp, which was that abundant earlier, 
reduce uh, greatly in size. So this is one example of a top-down uh, regulation of a community. But in general, communities in communities, both bottom-up and top-down processes operate together. So the amount of resources that is also important. In, uh, so I will end here, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy.